Hi, everybody. Welcome to opening night of Watch Time Live. My name is Minda Larson. I am the event manager for Watch Time Magazine. I am the person who's been sending you all those emails. We are so excited to see you all virtually. I see so many of you logged in, which is so exciting. So many names I recognize. We're really sad that we're not seeing you all in person this year. Of course, this year has been very interesting for all of us, but we're super excited that we can connect virtually. Um, so tonight we are celebrating Seiko and the 55th anniversary of the Seiko Divers Watch. Due to the pandemic, of course, we were not all able to be together. So our editor in chief, Roger Ruger, is calling in from Switzerland. And the Seiko team you will see is calling in from the New York Aquarium um, and Coney Island, which is really super cool. And I'm calling in from my apartment in New York City. So I just wanna go through um, a few things with you. We're going to begin the, the seminar shortly. If you have any questions for any of the panelists that you see, we ask that you submit your question through the Q&A button on the bottom, if you see that, and that will come to all of the panelists. And at the end, we're gonna save about 10 minutes for questions, and we really hope that you will um, have your questions ready for these panelists. And if you are selected, if we select your question to be asked, you will ask it live and we will put you on video. So make sure you have all your clothes on <laughs> and uh, you're prepared to be on video in front of everybody. And um, I see also a lot of you have raised hands. If you could um, write that in the chat or you can message me directly, Minda Larson at Watchtime, if you have any specific questions or if you can't hear anything and I'll try to get to that. Um, but yeah, we encourage you guys to chat with each other in the chat. And then again, if you have any specific questions for the panelists, please use the Q&A button on the bottom and then those will come to all of us and you'll be able to ask your questions live. So without further ado, we hope that you enjoy the Seiko 55th anniversary of the Divers Watch. Welcome to today's panel discussion with and about Seiko Prospects. I am your moderator, Roger Ruger from Watchtime Magazine, and I can promise you that this is literally going to be, among other things, a deep dive into Seiko's rich history of dive watches. Unfortunately, I can be with the panel due to the lockdown. I'm still based in Switzerland, but this is how things are going these days, and we're very excited about having these people on that panel. Um, but let's start with the obvious question to our panelists. Um, would you quickly introduce yourself, um, maybe tell us when you joined Seiko, and most importantly, because that's what we always want to know, is tell us what you're wearing today and maybe why. Sure, Roger. Hi, how are you? I am Munehisa Shibasaki, and I'm president of Seiko Watch of America right now. I joined Seiko in 1992, so I realized that uh, already more than a quarter century passed. And I love Seiko brand, and I'm very happy to be the part of Seiko right now. The, you were asking me a uh, what fit watch why I'm wearing today. So I'm wearing, of course, Seiko Prospects Diver's Watch. And the uh, SKU number is the SPB143. This is a series of uh, one of the modern interpretation of uh, our first diver, uh, 62 mass. The reason why I love this watch is exactly the fit size with my wrist. And I love the overall design, which is more, I mean, classic and vintage look. And uh, I love, really love the, I mean, the sunburned gray dial. So I think this is the perfect uh, daily use diving watch. I'm Eric Hoffman. I'm the Senior Vice President at Seiko Watch of America. Roger, I'm wearing the SPB 151, uh, the, uh, as uh, most people know it, as the Captain Willard. Um, it's super comfortable, really easy to read, and um, I am a fan of the movie where it coined its name from, from back in the, uh, in the 70s. So I'm, I'm a Captain Willard fan. 
Hi, I'm Becky Schott. I'm a professional underwater photographer specializing in underwater, extreme underwater environments, so caves, deep shipwrecks, and ice diving. And today I'm wearing the new watch made for the ice diver. And I'm John Dolan. I'm the director of the New York Aquarium and I'm very happy to be hosting this panel discussion here at the aquarium. And today I am wearing the Blue Monster, which is an awesome watch. I like the way it feels. I like the way it can go anywhere and do anything. And it is a classic for me. Speaking of classic, I actually brought the original Captain Villard, the 6105 with me today. Um, but I mean, you guys, you have not only picked fantastic watches, but I mean, a spectacular background, Eric, could you tell us a little bit more about the location you're currently in? The Seiko prospects and Seiko in general has had a long history of ties to ocean conservation. So we felt there was no better place to have it than the New York Aquarium, which also has strong um, conservation programs, which we are very proud to be partnered with. And I mean, just it looks amazing. So I suggest we dive right into why we're here today. Well, again, Roger, we are going to be talking about our Prospex Lux uh, product line, which is becoming more and more popular in the U.S. every day. Um, and for those who are not so familiar with uh, our Prospex line, I'd like you to watch this brief video. When adventurer Naomi Uemura climbed to the summit of Everest, I was there. When he became the world's first person to reach the North Pole, solo with a dog sled, I was there too. I've also shared adventures with many other challengers as they have fulfilled their ambitions. That wasn't a coincidence. They call me Prospects. The year was 1965. I was born as Japan's first diver's watch. Water resistance, shock resistance, legibility. Without these functions, a watch cannot be a true diver's watch. My creation was also a challenge in watchmaking. Just a few years later, I took a leap forward. I was reborn with a one-piece case that delivered greater water resistance. Around that time, Seiko received a letter from a professional diver. For a professional diver, it's vital to know the exact dive time. Seiko reinvented me so I could withstand the pressure of diving at 600 meters. My reliability at great depths has been verified in three joint tests with Jamstek. My performance has been tested in some of the harshest conditions on the planet by many of the world's adventurers. I was awarded the Sports Watch Prize in 2018, and again the Diver's Watch Prize in 2019. At the Geneva Watchmaking Grand Prix, one of the most important prizes in the world of watches. I am built for the people who take on the greatest challenges in the harshest conditions on our planet. Built without compromise, with over 50 years of experience, which is why the world's adventurers and professionals trust me. Today and tomorrow, I stand with the challengers of the world. Keep going forward. Prospects. Seiko. It's always amazing to see where these watches went and basically with the people that were wearing them, but um, Seiko is celebrating its 55 year anniversary of its uh, Seiko dive watch collection. Um, 
Shiba, would you mind telling us a little bit about the beginnings of Seiko's Divewatch program and more importantly, also how they became part of the Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition? And perhaps just by starting with where it all began with the 62 miles from 1965. Sure, Roger. In 1960s, when water registered watch was not widely available in the market, Seiko introduced its and the Japanese very first diver's watch in 1965. That is 62 months. With automatic mechanical movement and 150 meter water resistance. This is the beginning of Seiko become one of the leader in underwater watches. It proved its reliability when it was used by a member of the Japanese Antarctic Research Expedition from 1966 to 1969. After this very important mission, its successors, like the famous 6159 high beat diver and the 6105 famous second diver, frequently returned to the Antarctic almost as a standard timepiece for Japanese Antarctic research projects. Famous Japanese explorer, climber, like Naomi Uemura and Ken Noguchi, were all trusted Seiko when it comes to choosing the most reliable timepiece. We have received a lot of feedback from these professionals, and we used every single information for our new product development. Most recently, we put prospects through extreme testing by associating ourselves with Sinkai Submarine. Please look at video. We partnered with Sinkai to be able to test our product in the actual environment. As you can see from the video, these prospects models went way beyond the limit. This is proof that our engineer and craftsman dedicated their effort to create a perfect timepiece. 
Well, when it comes to dive watches, it is usually about form follows function. But last year, Seiko took a slightly different approach. Um, you introduced the LX series with spring drive technology that was slightly more on the design edge. Can you tell us a little bit more about this award-winning collection? Sure, Roger. The Prospects LX line is the pinnacle of Seiko Prospects collection and the combination of most advanced technology and craftsmanship. Movement is famous and accurate spring drive movement and overall watch design was developed in collaboration with Ken Okuyama Design Studio. Ken Okuyama, he has an international experience in the design of automobile and other high profile products. In addition, Case material is bright titanium, which is lightweight, and Zaratsu polishing work gave additional beauty of the surface. One of the remarkable achievements for Prospect LX was received Diver's watch prize on Geneva Watch Grand Prix in 2019 among Swiss watch competitors. And if I remember correctly, also in 2019, Seiko started to well, at least discreetly incorporate some of the watches nicknames that were given to them over the, over the last years uh, into its communication activities. Um, maybe could you tell us a little bit about the, the history of Seiko with nicknames um, or do you have a favorite? Yeah, I'm actually amazing how many nicknames Seiko watch has, especially in a dive PC. So actually I didn't realize I mean, after I came to the United States four years ago. So, um, but uh, my favorite uh, watch, which has a nickname, was the, this one, is the Seiko Ashtray. This watch is I purchased probably 25 years ago when I joined the company. And uh, still, this watch is one of the best watch with me. Well, I couldn't agree more. And I think that the Ashtray is a fan favorite among collectors. Thank you so much for these insights. Um, I suggest we time travel to the present and maybe take a look at what the brand has been working on in these past months and years. Eric, do you want to take us through some of the highlights of the 2020 collection? Roger, I'd love to. The first collection, which I'm sure you're familiar with, is our 55th anniversary trilogy, commemorating some of the most important milestones in the development of Seiko's dive watches. First, we have the SLA 037, which is based on a classic 1965 design. Seiko's in Japan's first dive watch, nicknamed the 62 Moss. The name comes from the original model number 6217 and the fact that it was the first automatic self-dater in a dive watch. The original was also water resistant to 150 meters. This was actually where the Seiko diver's story began. This recreation carries the same design as the original, right down to the fabric style reinforced silicone strap but has been upgraded to our high beat 8L55 movement and is water resistant to 200 meters and retails for $6,300. Next we have the SLA 039. The second member of this trilogy is based on Seiko's first saturation diver from 1968. The original was the first saturation diver to carry a 10 beat high beat movement. The recreation is faithful to the design of the original, enhancing the finish with Zeratsu polishing and also has a high beat 8L55 movement and is water resistant to 300 meters. One of the things I love about this watch is the monoblock case, which prevented helium from building up in the case and made it perfect for saturating diving. This piece retails for $6,800. Finally, we have the SLA 041, which is based on the 1975 professional saturation diver whose existence is partially owed to a now famous letter from a professional diver asking Seiko to create a diver's watch that could stand up to the rigors of the deep sea. The result was a watch that ended up with over 20 different patents on the outer case alone, including the L-shaped gasket, which eliminated the need for a helium release valve. This iconic design, known today as the Tuna, has a one-piece titanium inner case in the same iconic outer shroud as the original, but in ceramic. It has special ever brilliant steel incorporated on the bezel and is water resistant to a thousand meters. This watch retails for $4,500. Each watch from the trilogy is limited to 1,100 pieces. It really is an incredible collection of timepieces. Building on the legacy of the iconic 1965-62 Moss, we have reinterpreted the design with contemporary styling, upgraded materials, and a superior 24-joule automatic 
6R35 movement and water resistance to 200 meters. The new SPB143 is this year's ad style and keeps the design of the original with a slightly larger 40.5 millimeter case, but sleeker and thinner than previous interpretations. This piece retails for $1,200. In addition to the gray dial, we have a 55th anniversary limited edition, the SPB149. It has the same blue-gray theme as the Trilogy models, but with a bracelet, and comes with an additional silicone strap. This watch is limited to 5,500 pieces and retails for $1,350. Next we have LX. The Prospects LX collection mirrors the lines of the famous 1968 divers, but is updated with Seiko's proprietary spring drive movement with an accuracy of plus minus one second per day. Adding to this collection, we have the new SNR049, a spring drive GMT model with a dramatic blue and black gradation dial which is inspired by the stratosphere. The case and bracelet are titanium with super hard coating. It has a sapphire GMT bezel and retails for $5,500. After the introduction of the 1965-62 Moss, our dedicated engineering team remained focused on pushing the limits of high intensity watchmaking technology. An exceptional example was the 1970 design, which set a new standard in dive safety with its recessed crown at 4 o'clock, an iconic case design creating a built-in crown guard. The new interpretation of this well-known design, SPB 153, features the same iconic case shape and recessed crown as the original, with a slightly smaller and thinner case which hugs the wrist better and is more comfortable for everyday use. The new version of the Captain Willard, with its green dial with matching elapsed time bezel, is a subtle nod to the movie that gave it its nickname. This watch retails for $1,100. Lastly, we have a new 55th anniversary limited edition with a blue dial and additional silicone strap limited to 5,500 pieces and retails for $1,400. Roger, these are just some of the highlights of our 2020 introduction. As you can see, we are very proud of Seiko's legacy of dive and to be celebrating our 55th anniversary with these incredible reinterpretations. Well, I was fortunate enough to already review both the 1965 Divers Modern reinterpretation as well as the 1970 Divers Modern reinterpretation for one of uh, Watch Time's current issues. But the good news is there is more to come. Seiko Prospects has just announced a series of watches inspired by the world of ice diving. Um, this appears to be a return to the brand's origins, isn't it? Yes, Roger, as you saw in the video that we played earlier, Seiko Prospects has been to the Antarctic back in the 60s, and we hope to get Seiko Prospects back to the Antarctic in the near future. Um, one of the things that I found fascinating when I joined Seiko was the whole design process. And when I met with the designers, they told me how whenever they design a product, it is normally inspired by something of nature. And the models I'm about to show you were inspired by the beauty of the glacial ice from the Arctic. With a rich history of durability in the harshest conditions, Seiko divers quickly became the go-to watch for high-intensity exploration. These new prospects built for the Ice Diver U.S. Special Editions pay tribute to the durability of Seiko watches in the coldest and iciest conditions. They feature our 6R35 mechanical movement with a power reserve of approximately 70 hours. As I mentioned earlier, their three-dimensional dials in green, blue, and light gray are inspired by the various colors light creates when reflected on glacial ice. Complete with matching elapsed time bezels, Lumabrite hands and markers, and topped with a scratch-resistant sapphire crystal and magnified date window, these new U.S. Special Editions are water-resistant to 200 meters and retail for $900 each. 
Well, this is yet another collection of true dive watches with uh, an authentic history. Um, I assume they will be called Isumos, but we will see. Um, but I do know that I really look forward to seeing them in the flesh as soon as possible. And going through the comments on our website, uh, I'm not the only one that really wants to see them on the wrist. Thank you very much, Roger. These are truly beautiful timepieces, and we are all very proud of our designers in Tokyo for delivering such amazing product. One thing I would like to touch on, which you mentioned, was authenticity. And Prospects is truly an authentic dive watch. And with our Prospects built for the di Ice Diver collection, we have partnered with a truly authentic ice diver. Her name is Becky Schott. Becky Kagan Schott has devoted her life to the underwater world for nearly 24 years. As a photographer, videographer, instructor, and explorer, Becky has dived from pole to pole to capture indelible images below the surface. As a young diver, Becky was inspired by underwater photography. Now, the Emmy Award winner produces incredible stories from deep beneath the surface. She is passionate about sharing these wonders with others to educate and stimulate the imagination. Pleasure having you on the panel, Becky. Um, I mean, that looked really, truly amazing. And I know that you're both a professional photographer as well as a diver. And uh, I mean, the gear and the equipment involved with that is just, just insane. But just honestly, how dangerous is ice diving? Well, I've been fortunate enough to travel all over the world and dive in some pretty dangerous environments like caves and really deep shipwrecks. But ice diving is definitely the most dangerous type of diving there is. Ice is, I mean, first of all, you're in a remote location. It's really cold water, 28, 29 degrees, and there's just very little room for error. And then on top of that, when you're diving around ice, ice can change. It's very dynamic. We have to pick a certain kind of iceberg to even think about diving because if they flip or if a piece breaks off, that can cause really big problems. Um, and then there's other types of ice diving where we're even cutting holes and then diving down below the ice using ropes to find our way back to the surface. So ice diving uh, is definitely extreme uh, and also in, the ter in terms of uh, the equipment that we're wearing. You can't always rely on it working at all times because of that ice cold water. So regulators can free flow and you could lose your air in, in less than a minute. Uh, the, the exposure suits or the dry suits that we're wearing to protect ourselves from the cold. If those puncture or uh, if there's a leak, uh, then we risk hypothermia and there's all kinds of other things. The gear just does not like ice cold water. So when we're in these remote locations, uh, safety is a huge factor. Well, I, I can imagine that, but how do you actually get there? Getting to Antarctica is definitely an adventure in its own right. Uh, from here, from New York City, you fly down to uh, South America, Ushuaia, Argentina, the, the farthest you can go uh, in any country. And then you board an expedition vessel and travel for about two and a half days, sometimes in up to 30 foot seas, just to get to Antarctica. So it's, it's an expedition just getting there. That truly sounds like an adventure. Um, can you tell us a bit more, what, what was your most memorable dive so far? Well, so far my most memorable dive was this past February when I was in Antarctica. I had been there before and one of my dreams was to photograph a leopard seal. And we did, I didn't get that chance two years ago when I was there. And towards the end of my trip this past February, uh, I, I actually had a flooded dry suit, so I was really cold. I got out of the water early, and then I heard that there was a leopard seal close by. So we went over and we were able to get in the water with it for about 90 minutes. And this was truly a memorable dive because here you are at the bottom of the planet in one of the most remote places you could possibly be, surrounded in ice. And here is this majestic, very large seal uh, which is also an apex predator, just zipping around underneath me. It would come up to the camera and touch its nose to the camera. And to have wildlife interact with you like that, it's, it's really a treat and it's a memorable experience. Well, that sounds just amazing. Um, you mentioned before the, like the dangers and how reliable your equipment has to be. Um, I mean, that brings me to the obvious question. How do you personally use a dive watch? 
Well, I use a dive watch uh, for redundancy because we are diving in these environments and equipment can break. I do use a dive computer, but a dive watch is a, a perfect backup just in case a dive computer doesn't work because it's really important when we're diving to keep track of time and how long we're underwater and if there's decompression involved. So you need something that you can rely on. Thank you so much for the answer. Um, I think that answers a lot of questions also from the audience. Um, a bit more personal, do you have a favorite diver? Yes, the watch I'm wearing right now, the ice diving watch uh, by Seiko, because it was inspired by the places that I love and the different glacial colors that I see when I travel to these remote places. And uh, I personally am wearing the blue one because uh, blue, when you see blue in Antarctica, that's some of the oldest ice on the planet. So this reminds me of that blue ice. And I love that this watch was also inspired by ice exploration. And that's exactly what I'm doing. Speaking of remote locations, and I mean, we can clearly hear your passion um, for for ice and ice diving and taking more, more importantly, photos um, on the water. What's next? Well, we always have some expedition plans. Sometimes they're years in the future, but it looks like hopefully I'll be going to explore some crystal caves in the Bahamas soon. And we're also talking about uh, doing a Seiko uh, Prospects expedition back uh, to the poles to do some, some more ice diving. That sounds amazing. Yeah, it should be absolutely amazing. And to, to go back to the poles and you know take this watch ice diving will be absolutely amazing. It'll be literally cool. Well, and I think one other aspect of your job as a photographer is also to help us understand why it makes sense to preserve nature and ecological systems. So conservation, which has always been a huge part of Seiko's history, is also why we're currently in with this amazing background in the New York Aquarium. Um, can you tell us a bit more about why we are where we are? Prospects has had a long history of ocean conservation. And I'd like to introduce you to John Dolan, who is the director of the New York Aquarium. John? Thanks, Eric. And thank you, Roger. And to all of you out there, I just want to say thank you for your support. And let me tell you a little bit about what you are supporting. The New York Aquarium is not just a facility here in New York, but we're part of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is a global conservation organization spread around the world. So when you're talking about supporting us, you're also supporting more than 24 marine projects around the globe, all of which are featuring the preservation and conservation of marine wildlife. And we're also right here in New York City with the aquarium which we like to think of as an aquarium of the 21st century, which is a very different model than what we've seen in the past. Right behind us is our recreation of an amazing place called the Hudson Canyon, carved by the Hudson River through the continental shelf in the last ice age. It is the largest submarine canyon on the entire Atlantic coast from South America to Canada. The scale is almost mind boggling two miles wide, a mile deep at its largest. When fishermen are offshore of New York, they'll often talk about, I'm going out to fish the edge. They're talking about the edge of that canyon because that's where the action is and that's what we need to protect. So the great ecological function, a great cultural function, and the scientists at the New York Aquarium were the ones leading the charge to name this as a national marine sanctuary to protect it. And lastly, you know, Eric, you talked about the fact that Seiko designers are inspired by nature. Well, that's what obviously what we're doing here. Roger, you talked about the fact that we will only protect and conserve what we love. If we can bring that to the people, if we can show them what they are inspired by, bring them face to face, eye to eye, heart to heart with this beautiful wildlife, we know that we're inspiring not only a passion to understand these animals, but to conserve them. And that's what you're supporting. That's what Seiko has supported. And that's why this is such a great setting for what we're doing tonight. Thank you so much, John. This really sounds truly amazing. And I can't wait to finally return to New York and, and visit you uh, face to face. And maybe let's talk about turtles and turtles, how we know them and how we have them on our wrists. Thank you. Sheba, Eric took us through the 2020 collection. Um, looking ahead, what can we in the U.S. expect from prospects in the future? Yeah, I mean, we 
we will continue to focus on our core competencies and following the spirit of our founder, Mr. Kintaro Hattori, he, he said that always one step ahead of the rest. We would like to keep producing new products which meet uh, our consumer expectation. That is our plan. Thank you. Do you have any personal highlights from the collection? It is very hard to choose one product from 2020 new models. Personally, I'd like to focus on not only watches, but also the casing materials. We call Eva Brilliant Steel. This is an exceptional level of corrosion resistance and lighter, brighter finish than normal steel. This very hard material is used in deep water structures, but never before available in a watch case. As a real watch manufacturer company, we Seiko always pay attention to searching the best materials for professional, professional specification timepieces. Thank you, Shiba. Roger, so all night you have been throwing questions at us. So let me throw a couple questions at you. You've been doing this quite some time. So what do you see? What is your favorite watch that you've seen tonight? Well, that is both a very difficult, but also very easy to answer question for me personally, because I am fortunate enough to have uh, the tuna. I have the 300 meter high beat diver. I have the Marin Master. I think I have two Sumos. Yeah, both the SBDC 027 and the regular one. So just by exclusion for me, the 1965 um, redeputation is just something like this watch. It's just everything is right. Even it's just the balance the dimensions, the slightly vintage look and the two tone version with the gold applied index is just for me, probably my next purchase. Excellent. And you yourself are a diver, Roger. I know that. So why don't you tell me what your favorite dive spot is? What is your favorite memory? Well, I was fortunate enough to to go on dives in Egypt, in in um, like here in Europe, in, in the sea, and also occasionally in the Bahamas. But I will never forget one of my first dives, which was <laughs> and don't laugh at me, Lake Zurich, which is not even a dive spot. But for some reason, as a diver, you pretty much know what to expect from the movies you've seen, from the books you have uh, read through. But I have never really understood how a, a boring lake looks beneath the surface. So this for me was really different. And I, I really started to appreciate the fact that freshwater dives do not necessarily require you to, to wash and rinse your material as, as thoroughly as you have in salt water. Thank you very much, Roger. Really appreciate your time. Well, thanks everyone for providing us these insights and thoughts about how these products are created and at the end of the day also used and the impact they make even beyond um, us watch collectors and watch enthusiasts. Um, sadly, we couldn't do the whole thing in one room, but I'm very much looking forward to meeting you all soon again. And I think we're all very excited about getting some questions from the audience. Hi, everybody. Hi, everybody. I hope that you enjoyed that. Um, so our panelists are here. Roger, can you please say hi to everybody? Hi, everybody. Um, Actually, I have a question, if you mind me asking, because that's something that I really forgot to ask Becky. Um, Becky. How does one become a sea hero and what does it actually mean? Hey, Roger. Uh, so, yeah, two years ago, I got the honor of becoming a Patty Sea Hero, um, actually, well, Seiko uh, Sea Hero, and it's sponsored um, with Patty, the big, a big dive organization. And I, I didn't even know I was up for it. It was just sort of a uh, an honor that was unexpected. And uh, they chose me for inspiring others through my photography and, and video. Um, and to me, that 
that's one of the most meaningful things uh, because that's what I try to get through with the photography and traveling to all these amazing places is to, to inspire somebody to get out there, maybe see it for themselves and, you know, and, and protect the environment after seeing these amazing places. Thank you so much. And I think Minda, we have a question from Matthew. Yes, Matthew, are you there? Yes, he is. Oh, great, he is there. Okay, so Matthew, just one second, you're still muted. If you could unmute yourself. And if you could tell us where you're calling in from and also ask your question, please. Sure, I'm calling from Toronto, from Canada. Uh, my question for the Seiko team, I mean, most of the, your customers um, quite obviously are not deep sea divers or even swimmers. So why is it important for Seiko to continue to invest in developing very capable dive watches? And I wanna thank you for, your, for continuing to produce these capable dive watches and, and more importantly, at different price brackets uh, to allow all of us to enjoy these watches, whether we actually dive in the ocean or just uh, simply on our desk. Sure, this is uh, Eric Hoffman from Seiko. So Matthew, thanks for asking the question. It's a great question. Um, for those of you who don't know, Prospex stands for professional specifications. So our Prospex products are all ISO certified for diving. Um, this is a quality stand, standard and just shows the testament that we will build products that can hopefully with, you know, endure anything. Um, our dive products are made to, yes, go down 300 meters, 1,000 meters, but they're also there to, to show durability and they can stand up to anything and everyday wear, um, whether you are mountain biking, whether you are uh, uh, fishing, whether you are skiing or diving, ice diving, swimming. So it's all about the quality and the Japanese craftsmanship that's put into each piece. And um, that's what Prospects really stands for. And it's, you know, it's a watch that you can wear every day. It's a watch that you could wear at an event. Um, and just, it's all around great product. So thank you for asking that question. Thank you. And we have reached out to some of the Seiko Collector community groups online. And uh, that also brings me back to the beginning. I mean, you held up the ashtray, still not one of my favorite nicknames, but definitely one of my favorite watches. So I totally get that. So one of the questions we immediately got was, um, if Seiko will continue to actually launch reissues of famous or, or lesser known um, vintage pieces in the future. Yeah, I think, I mean, that uh, because the Seiko has a long history for the watch, fine watch making. So we have a lot of iconic, I mean, famous I mean, vintage models still we have. So, I mean, that is great chance for us to the, I mean, using the vintage piece to the production and let our fan know that our history and uh, I mean, to the pre, uh, to producing the, uh, the production model, they can use it in the uh, nowadays. So in order for us to the, uh, I mean, more informed to the uh, history of Seiko and the quality of Seiko and the production creation from the vintage model is quite important. Perfect, thank you so much for the answer. Um, Minda, quick question. We are having some attendees with raised hands. Are we getting these questions or not? We can try. I believe Andrew Jacobs has a question. Um, I'm going to allow you to talk. We don't know what your question is, so uh, good luck, everybody. <laughs> um, oh, cr Andrew, are you there? I'm, I'm here, and um, thank you for taking a chance on me. <laughs> <laughs> While you're wearing um, a tie. <laughs> no, definitely not. Uh, that is that is a stock uh, stock photo. Um, thank you for putting this together and, and uh, I remain a, a huge fan of Seiko. Um, I have maybe a question that was partially answered before, but um, I, I've always wondered why um, watches are capable of to go to depths like a thousand meters, but obviously humans can't. Um, so, so I've heard some reasons for it, but maybe you could explain, um, you know, the the practical side of why you need um, that sort of uh, those sorts of, these sorts of depths ratings when obviously the human body has has limits. 
Again, it goes to really the quality that's built into the product, Andrew. We, we you know, there, when you go back to the history of Seiko, um, we had the first um, dive watch in, in Japan. Um, and, you know, they started with one simple product that was started at 150 meters, which was, uh, again, testament to the quality and how far somebody could go. And then we came out with a saturation divers uh, piece. Um, and later on in that process, we actually were approached and we touched base on it in the, uh, in the video that we were, we listened to the community. A diver uh, wrote to us and asked, you know, how can you further develop this product so that we can use this product for saturation diving at 300 meters? And our designers were put to the test and they, they worked in, as it said, we came up with over a, a product that had over 20 different patents to be able to achieve that goal of saturation diving. Um, and it came out with a special L-shaped gasket. And that's because we were pushed by our, you know, the divers that really were looking for a new watch from Seiko. And they continued to develop that product to be able to just go to these, these you know, super deep levels. But again, it, it's about how you can use it in your everyday life. And it speaks to the quality and the durability of that piece. So yes, it can go down that far. Nobody's gonna go down to a thousand feet um, unless, they, you know, they, they, in, <laughs> unless they're in a submarine, I would say, but um, and, and beyond but it's about building that product that can actually withstand those types of pressures and that type of durability. And it's a stand, that's a, a standard throughout, you know, all dive watches. I hope that answered your question. It did, thank you. I didn't know the human body could go 300 meters. That's amazing, thank you. Actually, it, can, it could theoretically go much further. I think the human body goes until 1500 meters, but then it, it really gets difficult, but the bigger issue is how you can actually have breathing gas environment at that depth though. That's the challenge, but biologically or physically, the human body would go deeper. Um, and I think also we're currently trying to get Philip uh, ask his questions. And while we're trying to get him on video, um, what's also interesting in the development of dive watches is, I mean, next to having the, the backup or the security added to a watch case, um, it quite often was quite difficult to actually test the watch to the depth it was developed to. And that's a great example when you see from when the tuna was developed until that practical test dive up to more than a thousand meters with the submarine. Um, it's quite often difficult to actually have the testing environment. So that just shows that the engineers wanted to have a watch as robust as possible, which turned out to be even more robust in, in reality than, than on paper. Philip, I can see your video. Hi, Philip. Can you tell us where um, you are calling in from and asking? Yes, I'm, I'm calling from my home in Los Angeles. Hi. Hope everybody's doing well, <laughs> hanging in there. Hi. Um, First, I want to say I'm, I'm not a diver by any means. In fact, I, I was shocked to hear that the human body can stand to go as deep as I think, Roger, you mentioned 1,500 meters, because I personally, I can't dive to the deep end of the pool. But um, my question is, I'm, I'm curious about what, um, what Seiko's experience has been at, at those sort of diving depths, the timekeeping reliability variances between quartz versus mechanical versus the spring drive movements um, and how pressure affects those different types of movements. I think, I mean, that uh, uh, we Seiko is the, probably the one of the very few companies to the, I mean, the expertise for the, not only the mechanical watches, but uh, we are inventor of the course watches, actually, so 1969. We are very proud of it. And uh, uh, we have, uh, I mean, course watches and mechanical watches, and uh, you know that the kinetic used to be, and uh, uh, we have uh, spin drive. So we have uh, multiple, I mean, option of the movement. and. Uh, also that, I mean, we would like to the, I mean, going to, to challenge every, I mean, the limit to each product, each movement. So I think there are not so many huge difference between the, the movement in the deep sea, 
but uh, I mean, accuracy is different. So I mean, if you were, I mean, more uh, need to accurate watches, probably the quartz watch, probably that I mean, spring drive watches might be good. But uh, if you have more reliability than quartz watches, or uh, I mean, quartz watches, because quartz watches need a battery. I mean, right. electricity might be leakage sometimes. I don't know, but uh, it might be happen. But mechanical watches more reliable sometimes because uh, if you wind yourself, they, they keep moving the watches. So this is up to the, I mean, the consumers, I mean, the, the preference actually, but uh, as Eric mentioned that the, our dive piece watches all certified ISO standards. So we are proudly offered to every watch is very reliable diver watch. Oh, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Well, from a technical point of view, and again, I mean, this is where we enter the world of theoretics. Um, quartz crystals behave slightly different under extreme pressures. Again, this is extreme pressures where no human being will ever go. And ironically, due to the pressure, you encounter first the crystal and case bag pushing the hands to, to a level where they can't move anymore. So this is like going to the extreme depth. That's, that's what would happen to the watch. And again, um, this is not where human beings usually end up without a body scuff or any other type of submarine. So never mind that. It's purely um, theoretical. We do have one question from Marcello. Marcello, are you there? Okay, I'm gonna read his question. He is here, but um, I'm gonna read his question. Hello, this is Marcello from Cave Creek, Arizona. Thank you, Watch Time, for creating this event and to Seiko and this wonderful group of panelists. I'm a longtime fan of Seiko as a passion passed down to me from my father. I've amassed a large hoard and a number of Seiko timepieces. Are there any plans or talks to reissue any of the skin divers from the early 60s? Thank you for your time and input. Seiko and all of you are greatly appreciated. Okay. Um, well, when we look at the product that we actually just went through, um, you can see that we just came out with the new um, version of the 62 Moss, which was the 65, um, the dive watch, that it was Japan and Seiko's first dive watch that was introduced in 1965. Um, and we continue to go back and look through our, our archives and the designers are always looking for recreations. Um, Seiko has been around since 1881 and we have had many achievements in watchmaking and timekeeping. And with that type of legacy, and the ability to go back through over 135 years worth of watchmaking, I assure you there'll be more recreations of some of our finest pieces and introductions. So hopefully that helps to, to answer your question. Does anybody else have any questions for our panelists? Any divers in the audience have any questions for Becky? You could raise your hand. I believe that is all the questions from our audience. Roger? Well, I have one. How did you train the sharks in the background to behave that, I mean, this is like, like on command. We had turtles, we had sharks. This is whoever trained them deserves uh, <laughs> applause. But otherwise... Um... I would like Becky to say hello to everybody since she is here live and I'm not sure everybody has seen her. Becky, can you please say hello? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, I did, I think, answer one question from Roger. And uh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, <laughs> actually, I, I want to I want to chime in on the uh, the question that was asked earlier about uh, depth and diving. Uh, I I know a, several expedition teams that are doing over eight hundred foot dives. So 
uh, divers really are going to those depths and pushing the limits of the human body and physiology. And it's pretty incredible what they're doing. Uh, and I also have, uh, I know several people that are commercial divers that regularly do anywhere between, you know, seven and a thousand, 700 and a thousand foot dives uh, using full hard hats and different gear than scuba gear, but um, definitely uh, not in a submarine. So it's, it's pretty fascinating, but the guys that are going to 800 feet it's it's a pretty amazing feat. Uh, I only go to like 400 myself. <laughs> um, Becky, we did just have one uh, question come in for you from Jason. Jason, are you there? Well, he is. I see the choker. Um, okay, so I'll ask his question. Question for Becky. Do you prefer photographing wildlife or shipwrecks? Any other run-in with predators like the leopard seal that you mentioned? That is a great question. Um, you know what? Through my my 24 years of diving, I've I've evolved, and I like all different types of environments. Uh, I was a cave diver for a long time. I still am, but right now I'm really into shipwrecks because I love the history, and there's so much that goes into it. Like with a shipwreck, there's a story, a human story to tell, and there's artifacts and um, it's just it's eerie and kind of spooky and I, I kind of like I kind of like that um, but I do mix it up and still like to shoot wildlife as well I've had some amazing encounters with dolphins in the Bahamas where I mean they've just stuck around with us for 30 or 40 minutes just just spinning and buzzing around and that wasn't even on scuba that was that was snorkeling um, and funny enough some of my most amazing experiences in the water have been uh, just even in the snorkel zone with manatees, uh, whale sharks in Mexico, um, all kinds of different shark species, turtles, manate uh, I said manatees, um, the leopard seal that was snorkeling. So you don't even have to be a diver to really get down there and, and see the beauty of the underwater world. There's some really amazing snorkeling, um, amazing wildlife that you can encounter while snorkeling too. Um, we had one more question, Becky. Why, if you know this one, why is old ice blue? I do know the answer to that question. Um, so, and don't <laughs> quote me on this exactly, but so um, old ice, blue ice uh, is glacial ice and it's blue because it's been compressed for, for hundreds of thousands of years and even up to, I think a million years. And it's uh, it's compressed, so all the air bubbles have been pushed out of it, making it just super, super clear. And when the light hits it, it reflect, it just refracts the this blue color. So it's very dense ice, since all the the air bubbles have been pushed out of it, and it just refracts this amazing blue color, which is it's stunning. I've never seen anything else like it. So you'll usually see the blue when a glacier is calved off somewhere like in Antarctica. And then now you've got a um, piece of iceberg that is starting to melt and you start to see that blue ice come through. Thank you, Becky. Um, we have one more question from Jay. Um, I'm going to see if Jay is here to ask this question live. Are you here, Jay? He is. I am. Hi, Jay. Can you let us know where you're calling in from, please? Calling from Canada. Hi, Jay. What is your question for the panelists? <clears throat> just a quick one to the panelists. Thanks for your, your contributions. Um, I'm just curious as to what informs your choices of uh, regional exclusives. I happen to be wearing the um, uh, Turtle Dawn Gray from overseas and i'm just uh, i'm wondering what your thought process is as to uh, when you choose to do one of those and what the design ideals are when it comes to that thanks very much i can try and answer your question um there look there's many different markets seiko's a, a truly global brand and um if we were able to make every watch we wanted to, I mean, it, it, it'd be, it, we would just be totally oversaturated. Um, so there's certain requests from certain markets. Um, we have many and there's many that we get turned down. Um, and, you know, it's really a design decision and a manufacturing decision. So they can't make everything we would love to make. 
So in certain circumstances, there's opportunities for markets to put in requests. And every once in a while, that request has been granted. Um, we were really lucky because um, of the whole ice diver, uh, built for the ice diver program, because, you know, we were talking with designers about something that we wanted to do in the U.S. exclusively, and they were telling us about this amazing concept that they had for coming up with these beautiful dials that were inspired by glacial ice. And that's how this Built for the Ice Diver uh, really came about. So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's not an exact science, to be honest with you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, Roger, if you have any final words um, or if there are any final questions for our panelists, please submit them right now. Well, I think something to all the divers on the panel, but especially in the audience, and that's again directed at Becky, um, how can divers help protect the ocean? Um, I mean, it's, it's, we go there, we fly, we take a car, we are tourists, but at the same time, we help raise. And you, having been awarded a sea hero, how can we, the regular divers, actually help and support this cause? That's a great question, and it's a, it's a that's a loaded question too. Um, <laughs> I mean, as a diver or any divers out there in the audience. I, I think what we can do, or the best thing that we can do is try to inspire others because we get these amazing experiences in, in places that a lot of other people will never get to go to or visit. So I think sharing those experiences and um, telling our friends or our family or coworkers why we love to do what we do and why should, why should they care about it? Because in order to protect something, people need to care about it. And why would they care about it unless they, they're educated about it or maybe they see an image of the place. So um, I think it's our responsibility as divers to share our experiences and um, help educate our friends and, and other people around us as to why these environments should be protected and why they're important. Um, I mean, I, I know they inspire me and they can inspire others. And even if you can get them out there and get them to take a dive course and show them these places, whether it's in Europe or in Canada or the United States or Asia, there is diving everywhere in the world, even landlocked states. So, um, you know, there's always, there's always something that can be, that can be done. Perfect. Thank you. Um, we have another Q&A. Minda, I haven't seen that one. This is from an anonymous attendee. Does Seiko participate in any watchbox shows like Basel World, Basel World, however you want to pronounce it? <laughs> yes, it, we, when Basel World was around, <laughs> we were, were participating and there are many different types of shows that we participate in. Um, with COVID, it's certainly put a damper on things and, and restricted what we can do. Um, and you know, it's not just the big shows, but we also support a lot of our key retailers in regional events. Um, and you know, there'll be more and more of those as the world starts to slowly open up. But um, certainly, um, Basel World and Watch Time, for example. Yay! <laughs> and now Watch Time Live and watch them live. Well, thank you all very much to the Seiko team, to our panelists for, for sharing this with us and for kicking off our opening night. And thank you to all of you attendees, so many of you tonight for your questions. Um, we are going to say good night for now and we will see you tomorrow bright and early starting at 9 a.m. with Bell and Ross. And we have three days full of events that we Hope that you will join us for and have all your questions ready as we can still connect to each other within the, the watch industry and the watch world. And we're so thankful for Seiko for this beautiful presentation and kicking us off tonight. Good night, everybody, and see you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.